since uh, I had the quite perfect forecast and rational expectation, expectations, I knew that you wouldn't see in the PowerPoint, <laughs> so I have just images. Uh, my, my team is socialization of investment, Keynes, Minsky, and beyond. Of course, the starting point is John Maynard Keynes, chapter 24. There, he says that his theory is mod moderately conservative. The state is important for uh, central controls, guiding influence, uh, but he thinks that uh, only a somewhat comprehensive socialization of investment is the only means of securing an approximation to full employment. This does not exclude compromises between the public authority and the private initiative and cooperation. Uh, uh, Keynes says there is no reason to suppose that the existing system seriously misemploys the factors of production which are in use. It is in determining the volume, not the direction of actual employment, that the existing system has broken down. Probably some of you knows this uh, lady. It is one of the greatest economists of the last century, and it is John Robinson. When I started studying uh, economics, uh, she published in 72 a paper on the second crisis of economic theory. The first crisis was uh, contemporary to the Great Depression. It was the crisis of a theory which could not account for the level of employment. So pay men to dig holes in the ground and fill them up again if you cannot do anything else. She says the war was a sharp lesson in Keynesianism after economists created a new orthodoxy mixing neoclassical economics and uh, Keynesianism. The second crisis was the crisis of another big crisis, the stagflation era, the 70s, and this crisis arose from a theory that cannot account for the content of employment. The question was not anymore the level, but rather what the expenditure should be for. Here Minsky comes in. This is the book of 75. Minsky is critical of Keynes on the socialization of investment. He says that there is an, an inconsistencies, inconsistency between Keynes' belief that it is necessary to socialize investment to achieve full employment and the view that the market does an acceptable job of allocating resources. The full employment of the 30 glorious years is a full employment with a conservative connotation. It was unfaithful to Keynes because investment has not been socialized. What we had was induced private investment plus artificial stimulation of consumption. Minsky said, towering hates socialism is in principle consistent with Keynesianism. And we are inevitably forced back to the question of for whom should the game be fixed and what kind of output should be produced? These questions were the questions of the New Deal. Uh, this is a book from a conference in 81. Uh, I was there listening, I knew already Minsky. Minsky was a speaker. He presented a paper uh, which was, was published in 81 in Telos, the breakdown of the 60s policy synthesis. His idea was that the Keynesianism, uh, let us say 45, late 70s, had a surrogate of full employment policy. What if, if full employment is to be achieved and sustained, we need production and employment schemes which are based on innovative extra market uh, activities and innovative private enterprises schemes. I think this fits very well of Mariana Mazzucato's uh, uh, ideas in her, in her book. So what we have is that Keynes in the general theory, according to Minsky, says, th says that capitalism is flawed, the cure is socialization of investment. The socialization of investment was, not ne was never uh, implemented, but the same ideas of Keynes were that the socialization of investment should not go so far as to imply the use of productive capacity socialization. The idea of Ayman Minsky was that more is needed 
What is needed is to determine the pace and direction of investments. Most of what I'm saying are quotes, uh, are not my, my personal elaboration. Uh, in 90, he published in Italian a paper which is published in 92 uh, in English, Schumpeter and Finance, uh, in honor of Paolo Silos Labini. Here I may be very quick because that paper is one of the key papers where he is presenting the stage approach to capitalism. Randy uh, Ray talked about that before. Capitalism is an evolving historical system which changes internally and endogenously, new combinations in productive structures, but also innovation in financial institutions. There are four stages, commercial capitalism, financial capitalism, managerial capitalism, money manager capitalism. The key points are what is finance and who does the approximate financing. Mm? I skip a lot here. I just focus on managerial capitalism and uh, uh, money manager capitalism. In managerial capitalism, bank loan financed uh, production and investment force surplus and profits on the economy, but in that period, the same government deficit spending uh, was a major force in creating profits. And already then, Minsky says that the same effect could be uh, um, produced by mortgage, finance, household purchases. In that period, uh, corporate managers dominated over bankers and shareholders. In money manager capitalism, it is very different. We know that institutional investors are the masters of the private economy. Uh, the, the game is stockholders valorization. Blocks of managed money made financial markets the major influence looking for capital gains and, and returns. Uh, here, um, there is a divorce between financial markets and capital development. This is compounded by firms over capitalization. That is, firms themselves becoming a kind of financial intermediary and going more and more into, into debt. Minsky died in 1996. Then there was the, the so-called Great Recession or Lesser Depression uh, after 2007. And people started to read again Minsky. What is the Minsky's relevance uh, today? I am very much in favor, as I think uh, Randy Ray is, uh, of a backwards reading of Ayman P. Minsky. Read him from the hand of his thinking from his stage approach to capitalism. And I think that financial instability hypothesis can be redefined, not just as due to uh, firms uh, indebted uh, in increase, leverage, but also households uh, leverage. Um, the point, the, the relevance today for me is especially on economic policy, because uh, Keynes thought that capitalism is flawed. Uh, but even his uh, mild socialization of investment aborted. Minsky is useful because he is an alternative today, not only to austerity policies, but also to just a generic pump priming. His view is of a socialization of towering aids and leading sectors with communal consumption. His view is of having a larger role for the state, low private investment, capital controls, a bias against giant financial institution. Mm? Now, my idea is that on this, Minsky's perspective is coherent over time. In the mid-70s, in his book on John Maynard Keynes, it was very radical. The language was very radical because the period was the period of the crisis of Keynesianism. In the paper I told you of 81, uh, the language is still radical but more cautious because the problem is Reagan. So his criticism of traditional Keynesianism is, uh, is uh, uh, milder. In the 90s, the problem is a collapse of uh, uh, socialism. So the rhetoric is we may have a, uh, um, a better, more su successful capitalism. My idea is that after the Lesser Depression, we need a radicalization of the radical Minsky. Uh, Many people say that the depression uh, now is over. 
Uh, Minsky loved to quote great philosophers which were uh, baseball players or coaches. Uh, one is Yogi Berra. He attributed this phrase to Yogi Berra. It seems that this phrase was, was used actually by Ralph Carpenter. It's not over till the fat lady uh, sings. Uh, I think that today we need to take up again more than Keynes, Minsky's view, which is a new view. It is not just to go back to the New Deal, because the New Deal was not Keynesian. Uh, Roosevelt was against deficit spending. It is not just to go back to generic pump priming. It is to put together the intervention on the composition of output together with the, uh, with the um, level of output, which means to go towards, uh, uh, as Minsky said, not only a situation in which full employment is led by a government which is direct employer, but also in which we have extra market, extra private enterprise and employment uh, schemes. I close here saying that uh, this is very, I think, coherent with the idea of Mariana Mazzucato that the state must push firms and markets, so to speak, from above, uh, but we also have to uh, need to have a state which is pushed from, from below uh, by social conflict and social agency. And this is a, uh, an heritage, a legacy also of the, the 30s and the New Deal. Thank you, Ricardo. <laughs> and, you're going to, and you're going to see some common threads with Paulina and then Andy uh, and Giovanni and Andy on, on, uh, on the, uh, the statement that uh, Ricardo is doing. Paulina is going to go on the Keynes side. Okay, um, so my paper is about the mission in mission-oriented finance. And I'd like to offer you a slightly different vision of what that mission is. We have talked a lot about inclusive growth, well, we haven't talked enough about inclusive growth. We've talked about a lot about innovation-led growth. But when we mean inclusive growth, we really mean growth that addresses the two outstanding faults of economic society that Keynes and others have pointed to us. And those are the failure to secure true full employment and the arbitrary and inequitable distribution of income. So what I'd like to posit today is that the addressing these two outstanding faults are prerequisites for benefiting from innovation-led growth. What is growth for? What is innovation for, after all? So um, my, uh, my argument here is that, yes, directionality matters very much. Um, the way it matters in the way we finance investment or innovation, it very much matters in the way we do fiscal policy, in the way we stabilize the macroeconomy, and in the way we attempt to secure full employment. So um, in my own INET project, that's what I essentially do. I, I try to rethink fiscal policy, the orientation of fiscal policy, and argue that the current orientation is inappropriate. The direction is wrong. It's upside down. And so I'm going to give you a little taste of what, what the argument is. But essentially, for this paper, um, I go through a, um, a, what is a, a reinterpretation of Keynes um, that I have in, in, in a paper. Uh, but it's really a resurrection of the proper Keynes. Um, and then I talk about the link between unemployment and inequality. Then I talk about the link between fiscal policy and inequality. And then I rethink fiscal policy and the counter-cyclical stabilizers and the safety net. So very briefly on, on those topics. The basic premise is that what passes for Keynesian policy today is not Keynes. It's very far from Keynes. Okay. Um, this slide has a lot of text, but the mission. What is the mission? For Keynes, the mission was to secure full employment, and he defined it less than 1% unemployment. That is the tightest definition of full employment I have seen anywhere. What do we do today? We talk about the Nairo. We redefine the Nairo when we can't reach the Nairo. What is the theory? Randy and Ricardo already talked about it. Keynes talked about effective demand. Today, we talk about aggregate demand. 
All we say today is if investment falls, government spending rises, and all will be well. That's not what Keynes was talking about. He was talking about fixing the point of effective demand at a level that will secure full employment over the long run. But effective demand is determined by expectations. You can't manage expectations. You can't manage profit expectations. I mean, you could attempt, and you, you should, but you really can't fix them such that firms will provide jobs for all. It, they are not in the business of providing jobs for all. That's the job of government. Just like we were arguing the last two days that the state has to invest where the private sector won't, that's essentially the argument for full employment. The state has to create the jobs where the private sector won't. All right, um, what happened? <laughs> Do we have, oh. Oh, pardon me, this is me. Okay, so what Keynes talked about is long-run direct job creation as a preventative method. It's done before, full employ before unemployment develops. It's not a stopgap depression solution. It's not you know, a cure once we have a huge unemployment problem. You just do this on an ongoing basis. Public works, targeted employment, direct employment in distressed areas, in good times or bad. This is the Keynesian solution, and that's what I call, using his words, the on-the-spot employment approach to uh, fiscal policy. The method is we target the labor demand gap. You read him carefully, you will see he will not talk about output gap. He talks about labor demand gap. All right, so what do we do today? Well, we have Keynesian policy, not Keynes's policy. And the way the mechanisms work, it's really what we're targeting is growth and investment. And there are various methods in which we attempt to achieve that. So we've got you know, the old trickle-down supply-side economics. We cut top marginal tax rates. We hope to influence um, uh, incentives. And that will lead to growth. And that will lead to investment. And then the, f the jobs will flow. Or what we've done recently is we work through banks. We fix bank balance sheets. We attempt to induce a wealth effect, right? We buy the toxic assets. We induce a wealth effect, and we hope and pray that they will make loans. They'll finance investment, and then growth will come, and jobs will follow. Or we do contracts to firms, right? The, the conventional pump priming, right? We give contracts here, contracts there, boost investment, boost growth, and then we hope that jobs will follow. But jobs don't follow. And increasingly, it takes longer and longer and longer to recover the lost payrolls. So what we've got here is an approach that's top down. It, employment is always at the very end of the distribution chain. And what I'm suggesting is that we've got to flip this. And we have to have employment-led growth model, where we target jobs, we target employment. Now, in terms of providing contracts to firms, and you see this in the Recovery Act, that is certainly uh, an appropriate strategic decision. You need to provide contracts to firms. You need to define what your strategic objectives are, finance, innovation, and all of that. That must be done irrespective, but this is not a macroeconomic stabilization policy for full employment, right? Uh, what you do is you stabilize employment, and then you do these various other initiatives uh, as a separate um, uh, policy objective. All right. Um, just because of time, <laughs> I'm skipping through the words. But what ends up happening through the current approach? Well, what ends up happening is government actually reinforces the employment cycles that we see in the private sector. What the private sector does, it, it hires the employed and employable. Those that are high wage, high skill, hired first, fired last. Low wage, low education, hired last, fired f first. So when you work through the private sector channels, you reinforce this cycle. Right? The, the job of government is to do the opposite, not to mimic what the private sector is doing, but in fact to break the vicious cycle that is brewing among the low-wage, low low-skill workers and provide the employment opportunity when there will be none in the private sector and then permit the upgrade of skills, the transition from public sector work into private sector work. So it's, um, so we are looking at uh, breaking these, um, these vicious cycles in a particular segment of the labor market. Of course, unemployment breeds unemployability. There's lots of data that shows that, um, you know, it's much harder to get back into jobs 
even if you've been out of a job for a short period of time. The mark of unemployment is like your scarlet letter, right? Firms look at you and they will always hire those who have jobs first, who have been out of employment for a short period next, those for a longer period of time last. So you want to break, break this, um, this vicious cycle. When unemployment breeds unemployability, that's reflected in the long run rise in long-term unemployment. That's particularly important amongst young people. Um, <clears throat> and then when you examine what growth, growth brings, you actually realize that growth brings inequality. So I, I like to look at the inequality data, I'm using Piketty and Saez data, by business cycle. I want to see when the economy grows, who gains, who benefits. So if you look from trough to peak at if income growth and you look at how that has been redistributed, you notice that the top 10% get larger and larger share of the income distribution. And we know that this is a very exacerbated process over the last four, four decades. But this has been happening during the golden era too, right? We've, we have like a slow erosion in the income distribution even in the first few decades. And my argument is that the reason why this is happening is because we really haven't addressed the employment issue. That is, we have not stabilized income at the bottom of the income distribution. We haven't stabilized employment at the bottom income distribution. We have permitted these vicious cycles and long-term unemployment problems to develop over time. This doesn't have to be the case, right? If you look at, for example, a country like Sweden, the exact opposite had happened during the golden age. There has been an improvement in the income distribution. Every growth period brings more income towards the bottom of the 90%. And the difference, the policy difference is that we know that Scandinavian countries have had always an explicit commitment to true full employment. They have had employer of last resort policies, direct job creation, very much the kind of Keynesian policies that we've been talking about. Always hiring those who have been left out from the restructuring process that has taken place in the private sector. And, and this has mattered in the, in the income distribution. Okay, so what do we have today? Right, let's just briefly say a few words about the counter-cyclical stabilizer. The unemployed are our counter-cyclical stabilizer, right? You, the economy you know, um, slows down, people basically are laid off en masse, we provide income support, unemployment, right? you, you know, private employment goes down, uh, unemployment goes, goes up, uh, unemployment insurance is sort of the floor that we provide to incomes. Right? And we sort of stabilize this, this collapse. And um, we still leave people in idleness. So that is, that is sort of our basic unemployment buffer stock. Unemployment expands, unemployment shrinks. Well, how about having an employment buffer stock? Instead of moving from private sector employment into unemployment, how about private sector employment to public sector employment for the public purpose? And as the economy recovers, you transition, if you should wish so, into private se sector better paid employment. So what I'm suggesting is that this is not only a better counter-cyclical stabilizer, but it's a better safety net. This is the one missing piece in our safety net. We have figured out all other safety nets, but except for this one. So what happens? When the problem is income retirement security, what do we do? We provide income, retirement income, right? Uh, retirement income. When the problem is homelessness, we provide a home. When the problem is food insecurity, hunger, we provide food. When the problem is not having a job, we provide unemployment insurance, right? So what I'm saying is employment should be the safety net, not unemployment uh, income. And so there are various models that, have, um, that, uh, that can secure this, the employer of last resort, the job guarantee. The job guarantee has been explicitly recognized by the EC. We have, um, we have a youth guarantee proposal on the table. There are youth guarantee problems, uh, programs that have been very successful right here in the UK and in other places. This is one good place to start. So what we've done here so far is we've tried 
the top-down approach. We have tried the fiscal policy through the prim priming the pump, the pro-growth uh, approach that doesn't directly deal with the employment problem. I'm proposing that we do the bottom-up approach now. Thank you. Thank you. And the common threads keep on, as you're going to see, they keep on being thread. Thank you very much. Giovanna. Uh, yes, uh, I don't know how. Uh, about the same. Yes. About the same, okay. Okay, thank you very much. So this is gonna be the talk of my presentation. And uh, I must say just that I was very happy when I arrived here at the conference because I found out that Bergamo is actually in the US because they put it on my badge. So if you're wondering why my English or my American is not as good, it's because actually Bergamo is in Italy. <laughs> so just in case. <laughs> now, this is what I'm going to talk about during this presentation. I'm going to speak about some, some flaws on in the na na national system of innovation literature, especially regarding the conceptualization of the state. I'm, I'm going to speak about how this literature try to introduce or analyze financial systems, then probably this is the part I'm gonna uh, skip because we spoke a lot about this yesterday and also this morning, something about the financialization of the economy and there's some policy suggestion. Now, <coughs> the national system of innovation literature started in the, the middle of the 80s, uh, beginning of the 90s. Three were, let's say, the most famous book, books and authors that try to set track about uh, the definition of what a national system of innovation is. You can see here the definition from the book by Freeman. Uh, the book was entitled Technology, Policy and Economic Performance, Lessons from Japan. Then there was the book by Lundvan in 1982, National System of Innovation, that was the title. And then there was the book by Nelson, National Innovation System, a Comparative Analysis. So here you can see uh, the three let's say most important definition about uh, NAC. And uh, uh, I just, I, I decided to work on this definition because as I said, these were the first and the most important one. And from this definition, immediately you can understand that though all the definition share the idea that the NSE is something related to institution and is something relating to the fact that firms, when firms innovate, they are not alone. They don't live on an island, but they are in environment. So there are institutions that can help and foster firms to innovate. They never mention explicitly, the, uh, they never mention explicitly the state or government policy. So it's all about institution. This is, let's say, the first, uh, what I call, flows. So definition is, uh, uh, doesn't consider state explicitly. The second point is that if you, if you had the, the definition in mind, uh, you see that the definition are so broad that any kind of institution can be included in what a national system of innovation is. So uh, it's not very, the, uh, the definitions are not really nice tools to use or to analyze the national system of innovation of a country. Uh, the, another point is that generally when this kind of literature began, uh, it was a kind of descriptive tools. So the idea was to look at national system of innovation in different countries and to see how they worked. So what are the main actors, what are the main institutions, etc. Uh, as I mentioned before, the first book by Freeman, the, the title was Lessons from Japan, because uh, Freeman was looking at the Japanese uh, system of innovation in the, in the 80s when Japan had a big boom in some technologies and see how it worked and what were the main elements and stuff like that. So while the concept started as a descriptive tool, and uh, so uh, the idea was also to compare different national system of innovation of different countries and uh, to see, as again, what were the main elements, it, it became uh, almost immediately a normative tool. So the idea was, let's compare different system of innovation of different countries, which see which is the best one to foster innovation, to help firm to innovate, and then copy in our own countries, which is already something very difficult to do, exactly because if innovation system is related to institution, the institutional environments of, di of different countries are very different. So. Mo most of those studies were kind of trying to find benchmarks to 
follow and to imitate uh, uh, national system of innovation of country that were doing little innovation and trying to implement this kind of uh, uh, systems of innovation. The other problem was that immediately uh, this approach has a kind of supply side orientation. That means that <coughs> Uh, the state as well, though not really mentioned, explicitly mentioned, the state and institution have just the task to supply the right assets and the right environment for firms to innovate. So, uh, for example, this was at the base of most of the educational uh, policy. You have to create uh, a system of education that creates the right talents or the right uh, graduate students or the right PhD students that then go, will go in firms and innovate. So, uh, it was immediately, uh, according to me, this is a uh, problems because it doesn't see the, inter the real interaction that appears among the different elements of the uh, national system of innovation. And uh, another problem was that within this kind of framework, the industrial policy is seen only as a regulative task. That means that all the, the government or the state or public institution also at the lower level, uh, what they can do is try to regulate to, in general, with uh, some kind of tax incentive or disincentives to help firms to innovate. So uh, it, all these, uh, let's say, this theoretical tool has the idea that firms is the main actor innovating. Firm has to, ha to be helped to innovate with the right institutional environment, but still uh, firms is the big and the main actor. And my problem with this is that, uh, first of all, innovation has never been questioned. Uh, yesterday, but also this morning, we speak a lot about innovation, but the question is which kind of innovation and for whom? And in this, uh, in, in this framework, in the National System of Innovation framework, this has never been challenged. So it's not that any innovation is good or any kinds of innovation are good, and it's not that everybody can really benefit from innovation. So I think that when we speak about national system of innovation and we speak about the role that the state should have, should have in national system of innovation, these questions must be at least addressed. Then, um, after uh, some years, uh, the same people that were doing national system of innovation, okay, I've got to hurry up, <laughs> they start looking at financial system exactly with the same problem. The problem is that they were looking at the financial system as a new element to put within the national system of innovation. Again, we, so there was this lots of work studying if it was better to have a stock exchange, a stock exchange base or a bank based system, whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, as I was saying, again, the approach was the same, the supply side kind of approach. Let's see which, which is the best financial system that can foster the best kind of innovation. So to found the right financial system for the, for the right f kind of innovation. And this became immediately, of course, from again an, a descriptive tool, it, it became immediately a normative tool. So, so for example, the OCD pick up and makes this kind of taxonomy, which I'm not going through into because of course of the time problems, that gives you the idea of uh, the, the, bet, the best financial instruments according to which kind of innovation you can have. Now, at least I can skip this because, well, at least I can go through very quickly. Uh, financialization of the economy, we spoke a lot about this. <coughs> My point here is that uh, financialization of the economy uh, can be seen also as, oh, not as, can be seen as the result of innovation, financial innovation. And this immediately brings uh, back to mind again the fact that not all innovations are good, let's, let's put it in that way, some innovation can be very, ha very harmful, uh, sorry, some innovation can be bad or can have the, uh, problems uh, in the economy. But there is another problem with the financialization of the economy, which is exactly the impact they have on of, uh, of innovation. We spoke about this yesterday a lot, so I'm just going to show you the, the, the slides. Change in corporate governance and so the change towards short-termism, the fact that most of the resources are taken away from investment and innovation towards financial uh, assets or toward the financial markets because, of course, firms prefer to make profits through the financialization of the economy. So, uh, than to make profits by investment and create new innovation and, uh, and stuff like that. And there was also a question on 
talents and the fact that generally the financial markets and the financialization of the economy picks up also the best talents uh, and the best people, the best PhD students and stuff like that. For example, uh, in a nice paper by Dor that was speaking about in, mm, in financialization of the economy, he states that uh, chemical en engineers can make much more money as stock analysts in the chemical industry than instead of develop new chemical products. So there is also this problem about, as I said, talents and PhD or anyway, degree students. So uh, at the end, some policy suggestion. My policy suggestion is that not only the state must have a, a more active role within the national system of innovation, but this more direct and uh, stronger role should also be relating to strategic sector, very stra important and strategic sector. That means that innovation has to be thought in a way not only to satisfy, let's say, consumer needs, but also in a way to satisfy social needs. And that's the reason why I'm just making a, a, a quick list of the, uh, the social needs I'm thinking about. For example, innovation with a stronger intervention by the state, that means also state-owned companies with state-owned R&D laboratories that take, take up innovations in pharmaceutical sector, because in, those sec in that sector, we're speaking about the health of people, or in agricultural and food, because again, in that kind of sector, we are speaking about the food we, we eat. For example, uh, I can think about the gen genetically modified uh, food, uh, which is a result of innovation, but I don't think that we, we agree that it is a kind of good innovations. So, at the end, I think that at least in what I say, some strategic sector, the state must become an innovator of first resort. We, that means to think and to look at which kind of innovation we're speaking about and for whom and who gets the, the social benefits for this kind of innovation and to take some of this innovation away from market transaction and put it, as I said, in a social or, uh, uh, yes, in a more social inclusive uh, kind of growth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you see, the, the take into account the message that was sent. Uh, go, uh, Ricardo, a radicalization of Minsk. Uh, Paulina, back to uh, Keynes' roots, but the real ones. And Giovanna, very critical to the Schumpeter's followers. So, <coughs> so <laughs> some of Schumpeter. She is going to tell us then who she's not criticized. I mean, Andy comes now with the political economy of uh, innovation uh, priorities, which I think is very interesting to close up with that. Andy? I do, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a wonderful conference so far. It's wonderful to be here. Um, normally I come with a whole bunch of uh, psychedelic slides, but I'm unplugged for the next 12 minutes. So all you have to look at is me, I'm afraid. Or well, you can remember the psychedelic years. <laughs> Or you can look out the window if you prefer. Um, I'm going to really follow Mariana's plan as well. I'm going to really follow, uh, as Charles said, uh, from the previous talks. My title is Democratizing Innovation, from top-down missions to bottom-up causes. And at a wonderful conference like this, where we've been looking in such a hard-nosed, practical way at the business and policy challenges of financing innovation, that may seem, some people may hear maybe, I don't know, thinking, well, that's a little bit political. It's a little bit flaky. Why would that be brought to a practical place like this? And some of the reasons have been heard, but I want to build on those. Because so far, we have tended to speak of innovation in common with the vast majority of the policy and academic debates on it in terms of the magnitude or the scale the amount of growth, sectoral, national, or however it's divided, the amount of finance, the amount of investment, even when we start looking at the agenda we've picked up today, the amount of employment, the amount of inclusion. And I want to add to that, not detract from it, by pointing out that democracy is relevant not just to the overarching environment within which innovation sits, but to the direction of innovation at the micro scale. Now, let me substantiate that by just pointing out 
that it is the case around the world at the moment that the most, the single most uh, uh, intensive area for investment in science, technology, and innovation generally is not health or environment or shelter or food, it's defense. Depends how you measure it, there's all sorts of debates to be had, but it's not ambiguous. That's not hardwired in the nature of science. It's a fundamental question of orientation and direction. Likewise, again, it depends how you count these things, but there's no real room for dispute. The, the conventional figure is 90 to 10, that a very large fraction of biomedical research goes, 90% is sometimes given, on the ailments of the minority of the most affluent populations. 10% is a figure most often driven by political economy, driven by property rights, and power relations. Likewise, in the energy sector, we see the front covers of the investment reports from financiers or the big global uh, corporations alike prominently displaying wind turbines, solar panels. But there are some two or three orders of magnitude difference between the levels of investment in those directions for innovation compared to the established infrastructures of fossil fuels. And likewise, in the agricultural sector or pharmaceuticals more specifically, it is the case that investments tend to follow intellectual property intensive trajectories for innovation rather than the more open source approaches, which may often be far more beneficial per unit investment to their end goals of public health or agricultural production than, uh, than the intellectual uh, property intensive strategies. So this is, so far this is not news, we all know this, but the power relations operating in innovation systems do not just determine the magnitude, they determine the orientations. And that matters in the same way that the factors that have been brought up so far do as well, because the processes of appropriation that Mariana and colleagues draw attention to do not just concern the siphoning of magnitudes of resources, they also, in the case of the military or the intellectual property intensive or infrastructure rents, they also concern the appropriation of value in the orientation to the innovation as well. So this is something that often gets forgotten when we speak about innovation as scale. Innovation is a vector, not a scalar, and we should give as much attention to the orientations, the directions, as to the magnitudes. And this is why democracy is relevant not just in the setting of missions, but also in the uh, micro-level dynamics of the options available for pursuing those missions. So I want to just quickly address three basic points around that. But the bo bottom line is, if we uh, want to complement the economic and management and policy analysis around business uh, perspectives on these challenges, then it's not enough to look at the most visible structures. Those disciplines tend to look at those things rendered most visible by the established metrics. I used to do astrophysics, just like astronomers have found that actually you cannot explain the visible structures of galaxies without attending to the missing mass, which stabilizes them. Likewise, behind the measurable parameters that have um, understandably preoccupied us so far is the missing mass of power relations in society at large, the political factors. And that is as important to attend to as these other points. So very quickly then, my three points that I wish to unfold before closing. First of all, innovation, whether it's mission-oriented or otherwise, and in any given sector, is not about winning or losing a, spa a race, but exploring a space. So why is it necessary to say that? Because at one level, that's well known. But it continues to be the case that policymaking, for instance, speaks of it as if it's a race. We see, for instance, in the European Union, as well as in the, uh, the member states, many other countries around the world, cities, speak of innovation this way. I mean, in the European Union, it's called the Innovation Union because the main policy is being pro-innovation. And one sees that virtually every leader I've ever looked up um, <laughs> quotes from will use the phrase pro-innovation. Now, I don't want to be unduly provocative. I'm quite a mild-mannered fellow. But that strikes me, just to try and resonate here, as a kind of North Korean-style way of speaking about innovation. <laughs> Let me substantiate that. The whole, it's a bit like saying of a policy that one disagrees with in the health sector or the education sector, when a, an incumbent uh, politician or business person hears criticism of a particular policy saying, that's anti-policy, I'm pro-policy. 
That's the level of discourse we have about innovation, when the whole point of innovation is the direction, and yet we hear the mainstream discourse at the European Union, OECD, and generally, is about being pro-innovation. Mm. We're not even ha we haven't even got the language to attend to some of the most important factors. And of course, uh, many in this community will say, yes, Andy, this, thanks so much, we've heard you say this before, but we know this. We, in the innovation economics, have spent our whole time developing this for 20 years since Giovanni Dossi and trajectories and direction. But the point is, the dominant concepts, even in the more sophisticated technical analysis, are around catching up, forging ahead, lagging behind, leapfrogging. These only make sense in the context of a race. So my point is then that we understand very well the processes of path dependency, of lock-in, of momentum, of autonomy, of concentration, of regulatory capture, of entrapment. These mechanisms are very well documented in different disciplines. Every discipline that's ever looked at innovation sees these processes of positive feedback, increasing returns, which make what, in retrospect, what we actually come up with look like it was inevitable. But in fact, it's about choices, which are often invisible. So, let me just uh, substantiate that by giving uh, some examples. I mean, we'd have, I don't think this community needs much reminding of the importance of things like the QWERTY keyboards, narrow gauge railways, internal combustion engines, light water reactors, the automobile in the city. Examples of what, of particular technologies, I'm not, this isn't an anti-pro issue on the sectors in general, which are not controversial to acknowledge are suboptimal, but which we can't do much about because we're locked in. But when we look forward, at innovation choices, mission-oriented innovation choices for sustainability, for instance, in the energy sector, zero carbon energy, even though that seems, a and it is, a very demanding challenge, it remains the case that the world has actually enormous latitude for choice as to how it addresses that challenge. <coughs> Nuclear power, carbon capture and storage, radically different renewable strategies are available, any one of which could be the core around which we optimize the systems, we cannot simultaneously realize all those possibilities. We will, and we are making fundamentally political choices, but we're not speaking of it. Even the language of low carbon is not a direction. Likewise, in the uh, agricultural area, there's a, a, an awful hullabaloo about GM or not, as if that's a big issue. But actually, there are a whole host of different advanced biotechnology applications, uh, open source, uh, ecological agriculture, participatory breeding, which offer very strong benefits, potentially in different settings. But we have this polarized debate around what the incumbents want to do. We don't speak maturely about choices. So this is why I think we should be talking not just about how fast, uh, who's winning, who's losing, even just how much employment or how much inclusion, but also equally which way, who says, and why. And these aren't matters of, uh, I've got two minutes, so that should be fine, although I've just used up five seconds saying that. These are matters not just of indulgent politics, but about getting it right, about addressing crucial processes of appropriation as important as the others as this conference has uh, discussed. So to conclude then, the third point I want to make is the more imperative and ambitious and bold, a word we've heard in the conference so far, the ambitions for missions, the more important that is. There's a tendency sometimes with climate change or other challenges to say, well, actually, these are such huge challenges. They're so urgent. Democracy is a luxury we can't afford. I've got many quotes of people, including the European Union, uh, making comments of that kind. It's actually, when we look at the reasons why, for instance, sustainability is so strong now, the reason sustainability is up there on the agenda is because of decades of democratic struggle during the early stages, strongly resisted by precisely the incumbent organizations in academia, in business, in government, that now are picking up elements of that agenda. And even some of the innovations, wind turbines, a multinational business now on a par with, with uh, nuclear, and actually far exceeding nuclear, were it not for the role of civil society and social movements in, in, in largely in Denmark, we would not have even the technologies now, arguably, on which to base that. So democracy matters, not just in terms of uh, pr procedure for setting missions, but also at the fractal micro level of the innovations themselves. And we're not short of processes. I can't speak of them now, I haven't got time. Grassroots innovation, participatory deliberation. Talking about power in innovation systems is okay. Many, many ways where we can open up 
these kinds of choices. But I think these kinds of practical strategies, which like Cinderella don't tend to get invited to these parties, are as important as all the other kinds of policies that we've heard about so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. How long, how, how long do we have? How long do we have now for questions? Okay. <laughs> Before the questions, um, I'm going to take, you know, because <coughs> I'm sitting here, uh, five minutes of you. Uh, uh, your presentations made, uh, made me thinking about Benny Diaz and the Brazilian recent development. And look how interesting it is and the challenges that we face associated with each one of the issues that you raise, with, uh, starting the other way around, uh, with Andy. <coughs> Uh, when we're financing um, large invest infrastructure projects, hydro, <coughs> uh, we had to innovate on how we finance, because partially because <coughs> of societal demands. Yeah, so not only we, we had to finance the hydro, but the surroundings. Uh, um, you know, the sewage and the cities that spread out and the, the security. And this meant, and the difficulty associated with this is, even though we put financing available and we forced the guys that were investing to take them up, um, you start to bring to the table different municipalities, different states, different NGOs, different, and to converge interests. Put huh? So uh, to bring in society, to bring the bottom up, uh, implies lots of negotiation, lots of conversation, which is not easy. Uh, when on, on, the, on the innovation, when we're developing a business-led innovation policy, the strategic areas were defined, uh, you know, each one with innovation challenges and so on, and we used not only the state financing, but the also state procurement uh, uh, power. Now, the challenge there is to converge the capacity of different state agencies <coughs> to, use, to, uh, to use the instruments at the same time in order uh, on a given direction. And not only uh, there are political interests that are spread in different agencies, but also the technical capacity of each agency um, to uh, operate uh, efficiently. On the, uh, on the labor, uh, when imp implementing, uh, y y you mentioned uh, the Swedish, the Brazilian case is very interesting. We, we are a very unequal society, and recently we had, uh, you know, inequality I uh, is decreasing, which for us is, wow, you know, first time in 500, 600 years. Now, when implementing uh, economic <coughs> policy, so there was a central focus on employment, and the minimum wage was relevant and so on. Now, the problem then comes is, how sustainable a policy like this is, right? The minimum wage was increasing uh, hi higher than anything, any uh, other economic. Now, we get to a point where uh, shouldn't a uh, minimum wage have a minimum relation with productivity? And then you start to discuss, uh, you know, repercussion what will happen, which is not easy. And then the final one, uh, Ricardo, uh, when, uh, when we were implementing macro policy, there was a time about three, or three, or three years ago, maybe, where we did implement uh, capital controls. Uh, we implemented a more radical policy towards interest rate <coughs> and lowering it. In Brazil, it's crazy interest rates. Yeah, it's very hard. Now, the repercussion of that was so heavy that the markets have are taking revenge. And it is a political economy process that they are searching explicitly, you know, and, and the financial and, and you know the media using the media, down with the Minister of Finance and down with this and down with that. And now it's crystallized, because we have elections now, it's crystallized in a such a way that uh, it, the present government and the present uh, economic authorities are seen as devil, yeah? To a point where when, Dilma, when there is a, an election poll that shows Dilma falling, the, uh, the stock market jumps up. <coughs> and it is partially, it is a revenge for the radical um, 
macro policies that you were mentioning. So there are challenges uh, you know, associated with each one of the policy implications that you, uh, that you put up. But this is, you know, just, so, okay, Bill. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Pavlina, which uh, said that uh, we have to deal with what I would call stable and equitable growth, which I agree with entirely, since I've been doing that for about 30 years, trying to argue that we need to understand how we get stability and equity in the income distribution. Uh, I'll say something very heretical, particularly being in the UK. Uh, Keynes is not the answer. Uh, Keynes uh, uh, and uh, actually uh, Joan Robinson, uh, I think, is one of the, the guilty parties. She later rejected her theory of imperfect competition. There's just no, not a theory of the firm that can get you to understanding stable and equitable growth in a modern economy. It's not hiring and firing people in the labor market. It's not minimum wage. It's people having jobs that aren't just today, just aren't next week, but are for a few years, and we all know that, careers. Okay, now it may not be with one company, but historically in the, in the 20th century, in the most successful economies, it's when you had companies that were able to provide this stability and higher wages over time. I would say that is the cause of higher standards of living. That get that transmitted to the labor market, and other firms have to compete with that. Okay, so the, the issue then is not, in the first instance, demand management. In fact, I wouldn't even say in the second instance. It's corporate governance. It's uh, ensuring that companies that make profits share them with the people who help generate them. Secondly, it's not demand management in the sense of, okay, we don't have enough employment, stimulate it, that's Keynes. It's a permanent role of the government in the economy, really a developmental state. Okay, more. Uh, before, before reactions there, here, and behind there, and then Stephanie on this other, and then... Okay, um, can, I, can I disagree with, uh, with my good colleague, who I generally completely agree with about everything? Um, the issue of directionality is really okay, important. Parallel, parallel discussions, please, can you... Can well, it, you it relates to that, and it relates to Andy's point. Yeah, so, please. you know, the, the point about whether or not people have good jobs in good firms, um, and the quality of life, yes, that is important, but the nature of those jobs, and it matters whether they are in um, large investment banks that are screwing over countries, whether they are in large companies that are bad for the environment, where there are military procurement companies, that matters as well. So there's two elements of it. All right. Who's that? Who I said what was next? You. Um, question for Paulina. Um, I'm really pleased to see that you've addressed this question. For me, it's really um, fundamental to the topic of the conference. Could you say a bit more about the do's and the don'ts for designing the kind of programs that you're talking about, and particularly um, how much those do's and don'ts can be applied to bigger top-down programs, which I know is not what you were talking about, if there are any lessons for that? Then we're going to see if you're going to be hired or fired in a job, in a policy job behind that. Hi, <coughs> Fergus Green from the LAC. Um, question for Andy. I really enjoyed your talk, and I appreciate you ran out of time at the end to talk about the institutions of deliberative democracy and practical mechanisms that you might use to bring in uh, to sort of realise a bottom-up process. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could say a bit more about um, what they might be, or whether there's been successful examples. Thanks. Okay, Stephanie and then Mariana, and then we stop there. Get answers and then go back. <coughs> Stephanie? comment and a question as well. I like very much your emphasis on democracy and maybe one of the reasons why we don't have better, more radical reform of finance is because finance is so deeply undemocratic. The money managers and so what, um, and there's insufficient mobilization against that. So what yeah, lessons? I, th I think that this question can be, you know, uh, addressed by not only India. Maria. This is a provocation for the chair. <laughs> so I was a at chair Ed is not chair is chair. Ed Miliband's gala dinner two weeks ago. I was sitting near um, Nick Jagger's first wife, Bianca Jagger. I showed her the program. She said, "I want to come to the third day." I said, "The third day? It's a bunch of academics. Why would you want to do that?" She said, "Because directionality matters, and BNDS is a problem." 
course, I told her it wasn't true. Uh, building dams in the Amazon, she said. This is part of their innovation policy. This is not. OK. <laughs> yeah, and she's going to be blowing for the uh, electricity that we need. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much for the questions. Um, I'll address them in mixed order. First to Bill, we haven't tried Keynes. We don't know whether Keynes was wrong. We haven't tried him. We have not tried Keynesian policies. And what I was uh, talking about was not about creating a private, vibrant pri sector with good jobs, etc. I'm talking about a counter-cyclical stabilizer. I'm talking about the fallout from the restructuring, that wonderful disruptive technology when it comes in and while that displaces many jobs, what do we do then? Priming the pump doesn't work. So we got to really think carefully about the safety net. So I, you know, I use it you know, interchangeably as far as you know, counter-cyclical stabilizer and a safety net. Um, but the, the way I, I envision uh, this program is it will have to have some basic features and this also addresses uh, Jao's question on wages. Because it is a safety net and because it is an employment option, first I see it as a voluntary employment option. I don't see it as the kind of punitive programs where we are going to take away your unemployment insurance and we're going to make you work. No. If you want a job, there is a public sector job for you that serves the public <coughs> purpose. It's at a base wage. Choose it or leave it. Base wage, I've argued, should be a living wage. But the base of wage, the importance of that is that it is a base wage that doesn't compete with the private sector wages. So it just establishes the floor. It is an effective minimum wage because in conditions of unemployment, your effective minimum wage is a little bit above zero, even if you have minimum wage policies. But that basically establishes a universal minimum wage. And then, you know, whatever the private sector does in terms of uh, wages, you know, that, um, that is an anchor, mm -hmm. right? You, d you don't index it to inflation. You know, you could discretionarily sort of increase it with increasing standard of living if, if uh, that doesn't provide uh, a living wage. Some other features of the program, well, voluntary, base wage for the public purpose. I mean, I, I think Keynes is very useful. You know, unfortunately, he talked about digging ditches, but you actually read what he says. He says, what are the priorities of public policy? Number one, provide jobs at the margin. You target demand to distressed areas. Number two, the only task of policy is to make them better, to improve them, for the state to be an entrepreneur in chief, and to, in, to experiment when necessary. Then how do you design it? There are many different uh, models. You can think of the New Deal, Green New <coughs> Deal, top-down approaches. Um, I'm sympathetic. I, I really like the bottom-up sort of grassroots social entrepreneurial model where the communities, the young people, the unemployed themselves, with conjunction with the municipality, assess what are the needs of these communities, what are the resources, how do we employ them effectively? And so you know, that would be a very decentralized uh, approach. Um, thank you for the questions. I'll try to roll them together very quickly. Um, th this point about democracy is not a sentimental point. It's as hard-nosed as any of the other points we've been making. Um, there's a very well-established body of analysis in politics of various kinds, talking about post-democracy, about cartel parties. Th the phenomenon of concentration in politics, as in global business, is well-documented. And so innovation is not unique. It's just one particular area in which that's playing out and where are th there are the kinds of consequences we've seen. So uh, talking about addressing that is not special pleading. Um, how to do it? Well, th th there's no one panacea, of course. There's a whole set of different levels at which this can be addressed. First of all, speaking about direction <laughs> is one. Speaking about power. It's OK to speak about power in science and innovation. So much of the time, it's airbrushed out as if it doesn't exist, as if it just happens at the end out there in society, but it's very formative in innovation itself. That doesn't have any particular normative implications. It just means let's, have, let's be empowered to speak of it. Skepticism, an absolute defining quality control uh, principle in science itself, but when technology encounters skepticism, it's regarded as a pathology. Skepticism is as important a quality control uh, principle on technology as it is in science. And if we forget that, we risk going down a medieval route of doctrine and ending up deluding ourselves as to what are, in fact, the better and worse technologies. 
But more specific than that, there are, I mean, Germany at the moment is very interesting. I think largely due to the quality of German democracy in various ways, the Energiewende that's been mentioned a number of times in the conference is an unprecedented initiative. And the fact that it is Germany doing that with a poor renewable resource, an excellent nuclear industry, compared to the UK, for instance, is a very important lesson about the relative quality of democracy in the two countries, I would say, being a little provocative. And then thirdly, to be quick, uh, the point about uh, it's not easy. No. no one said it was going to be easy. Well, <laughs> In <laughs> innovation is not easy, and especially challenging power is not easy. Um, but actually, that's what democracy in all its different forms is about. I think one of the things, with respect, the sort of all or nothing, there is no alternative, so hydro or nothing, is part of the, part of the problem. I mean, there are challenges attached to wind, there are challenges attached to hydro. No, there's no magic bullet. But actually, there are alternatives everywhere. And rather than a no alternatives language, we should be speaking about the pros and cons of different alternatives in a more balanced way, rather than this or nothing. And uh, yes, I think I better finish there because I've probably talked yeah. enough. Yeah. Thanks. Can you, Giovanna, be it possible to democratize financing? <laughs> is it possible is to democratize? That is a question for him. There are already so many questions. Do you want to go first? Or? No, no, you can go first. <laughs> But not, no, no, no. not directly. Is very easy. No, no. My answer is very not easy. directly <laughs> on this question because the, the, the problem of uh, uh, finance is that uh, uh, there is the risk of thinking that we can fix finance without fixing the real economy, and that we can fix finance also putting democracy. Uh, in it. Of course, all, all this is very important. But it takes time. I, I want to go back to your question, but after a little bit, um, Minsky sometimes used this uh, this story. I'm not sure if my English has me enough. This story is a famous story in many languages. I think uh, of a, a kind of joke <coughs> or comedy with the first banana who is looking for his keys under a lamp. Mm. And there is a policeman that comes there and he says, but mm, did you <coughs> lose your keys here? No, I lost my keys there. Why are you looking here? Because here there is light. Now, in the discussions of this day and even today, I have the impression that uh, this is a common thing, you know? Uh, the Keynesians, the Minskians, the Schumpeterians, which I would call the Neo-Schumpeterians, and all that. I don't know if I am unlucky, because this may mean that I am schizophrenic, or I don't know, three times schizophrenic, uh, the three, three personalities, but my lungs are three. Keynes, Schumpeter, and if I may add, Marx. Keynes said something which is very relevant to, to, to what you were saying, and I think in the situation of the last few years. There is a fundamental flaw in capitalism. This has to do with the lack of effective demand. I completely agree with Bill Lazonic that we ch just can go back to Keynes. Actually, I use Minsky as a critic, not only of Keynesians, but also of Keynes. But this is what happened in a gigantic way in the last few years. <coughs> Then there is the theme of Schumpeter. Schumpeter is not just the author of innovation. He is the author of finance to innovation and capitalism going on in stages. Mm? Uh, the second thing somehow Schumpeterians may, 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 may look at in an unsatisfactory way for me. Uh, but the first very often is lost. And there is a point on which I don't want to go here because it will be a, a huge discussion, that is, there is a thesis of Schumpeter, which is against most of the discussion we are doing. For Schumpeter, the entrepreneur does not bear the risks. It is the financier. Now, I'm not a fan of the label modern money theory, but what is called the modern money theory for me is a sensible proposition, is that the government is not only able to direct the economy towards new contents, employment, etc. But at the same time, it is strictly connected. For me, it is not the same thing as 
strictly connected to the central bank as financier. So all the things that Mariani is saying, I would say within this, uh, uh, this more general framework. Mas, why is relevant? Because of the attention uh, to the uh, situation of labor and corporate governance. And I would say that all the problematic that Berlusconi uh, told us is very much related to the macro crisis we had and to the finance. Just my answer to you. My answer to you is that we have to put the question in space and time. I think that we never went out from this crisis. It has been a crisis of the almost of the dimension of the crisis of the 30s. So it requires a global uh, perspective. So I understand that Brazil, in a situation in which there was quantitative easing, money going there, the hope from, for some years that the BRICS or Latin America could be the buyer of last resort, bear the good and the bad of the situation. You know? But my proposal, my, my idea is that what we need now is a new revolutionary thinking. And then, oh. Revolutionary thinking. <laughs> oh, yes. Thinking. Uh, for me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that uh, I, I I can answer to the question you said before. The problem. Uh, can you move the microphone? Oh, sorry. Uh, the problem about uh, how to do the how to have a, a different role of the state within national system of innovation, and you raised a, bi a big problem that is a kind of organizational and institutional problems. But uh, my, my point is that if you go back to the literature to and to how they were suggesting, I mean, this literature came up with uh, from developed uh, advanced countries. And that kind of literature was trying to suggest to less advanced countries what to do. And the, sta the role state was not there at all at the beginning. You know, the, There was this idea that innovation is in the end of firms and everything they do is fine. And you just have to foster to give the right labor, uh, educated labor and stuff like that. So I think that is a big problem, even more for countries like Brazil and stuff like that, which are actually do having a different innovation system because you do have the role of the government in there much, much stronger than in advanced country right now. So it's, that's the main point. Two minutes. And no two answers. Minutes. <laughs> we have two minutes. So they cannot take. <laughs> right. I have a question to Pavlina. First of all, thanks very much for the presentation analysis. I much appreciate the mission and the directionality behind it. Here's my question to you. When you talk about employment policy, it seems to me that there are two aspects of it, two phases. One is the counter-cyclical uh, stabilizer, and two is the safety net in relationship to the broader trends in inequality. Uh, and the long-term trends you showed with the widening gap between top 10% and bottom 90% concerns the second aspect. So now imagine the policy is implemented. No, no, no. Question, please. Uh, question, uh, to what extent the policy you talk about will address also the second phase of uh, employment policy, not just the first one? How, will it close the gap? previous one was also on mission-oriented innovation, but they never used the phrase. But it was completely on that. It was about innovation in humanitarian aid. Now, the two things that kept coming up at that conference, which haven't really been mentioned here at all, they talk a lot about top-down, bottom-up, but they were really concerned about what they call the missing middle. Uh, in terms of the diffusion of the ideas from one to the other. Um, and the other thing that they also talked about was that how do you innovate when there's no market? It's a quasi-market at best. And again, I don't think that has been uh, sufficiently uh, addressed here. One phrase for you and one phrase for you. <laughs> one phrase with five words. <laughs> Democratizing capital can happen, impact investment. Six words, sorry. 
Um, actually, I just want to share um, two things here. One is that um, I've been involved in the project of the you know, inclusive innovation in, in OECD, and we have three dimensions. One, one is the social dimensions, one is the, uh, the second is the industrial um, dimensions, and the third one is the regional one. And all this related to those um, uh, the implementation of uh, and the grass uh, grassroots innovations. Uh, my question here is that what is the uh, relationship you think will be beneficial to the grassroots innovation uh, in the way that the uh, crowd financing? Do you have any ideas about that? Yes, maybe you can have an okay. explanation. One phrase from each one of you to end up. I, I give my okay. minutes to someone. <laughs> well, I think that I have to answer just to the question of uh, innovation in a closed market. Uh, it's, but I don't, I, really, I don't know if I understood the, right, the question correctly. Innovating is in a closed market. You said that. Ah. Okay. Okay. No, I, I didn't answer. No. Closed <laughs> market. <laughs> yes. Exactly. No. The <laughs> my point is innovation is exactly not for some innovation and exactly not for the market. And that's the reason why the government should step in. All right, a short uh, answer to the income inequality question. There are two ways you can improve the income distribution. You tax income after it's been generated and at the top and try to distribute it to the bottom, or you change the way income is distributed. The way we do it now, we have inequitable structures that generate inequitable income distribution. And then we think, oh, maybe if we tax it or we give it and we'll see, you know, maybe that will, it doesn't change the process, the inequitable process. But if you have employment-led growth where you stabilize employment at the bottom and you try a full employment uh, mission, right, then you change the way income is generated, it's employment-led. So you improve income distribution from the bottom by raising the bottom faster. You still will have to do other policies. It's not a panacea. You may still have to tax rent and other things and uh, think hard about income distribution. Yep, uh, how to address the missing middle. Um, first of all, I think it, there are imp crucial implications that innovation is a fractal process. It operates in similar patterns at every level. So it's not as if there are neat middle, top, bottom. It's about how to engage across the different levels. And in practice, I think there are all sorts of uh, ways of addressing this. Crowdsourcing can work in that way, but there are all sorts of pro procedures around grassroots innovation. Kit Malthouse today talking about the importance of creative industries to stimulate the scientists. Actually, I'd go further. That's a very good point. But creative industries, humanities, civil society are sites of innovation in their own right, and not just socially beneficial, but revenue-generating innovation. They are about innovation. So actually, it's not just about how to bring in mm -hmm. some sort of notional oversight. It's about empowering these areas that don't normally get invited to the party. OK. Um, and my proposal for us to get the bottom up and then to address Bianca's concern, Mariana, is that the uh, Institute of New Economic Thinking does its next meeting in the Amazon. So you get to know <laughs> what it is. 35 million people living there, and they must have a living. Okay, thank you very much, and I would like to have a